Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. In the last video, I covered the immersion cooling technology unveiled at the Tesla Semi event, and what that means for the V4 supercharger. However, I didn't spend much time on the Mega Charger, which I speculated was actually a different product than the V4 supercharger, and capable of over 2 megawatts of power output rather than 1. So today, I'll explain my reasoning for a 2 megawatt charger, evidence against that, and the grid-related implications of mega chargers. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. Let's pick up where we left off in the last video. I expect Tesla to have four versions of vehicle charging infrastructure in place by later this year. First, the old version 2 superchargers that have around 150 kilowatts of power. There's still quite a few of these around, but the technology is now about a decade old. Second, the current generation version 3 superchargers that have 250 kilowatts of power output. I'm guessing that, as per Elon's hint in this tweet, that those will all be upgraded to 300 kilowatts of power output. Third, version 4 of the supercharger, which is launching this year. Tesla hasn't provided a number yet, but I'm hoping for at least 500 kilowatts so that the long-range version of the Cybertruck can charge at the same rate as the rest of Tesla's vehicle fleet. If you'd like to know more, check out the last video. Fourth, and finally, the Mega Charger for the Semi. Again, Tesla hasn't provided a specific power output, but I've listed 2 megawatts because my view is that's what will be required for the Semi. Let's take a look at the evidence for and against my estimate. Tesla set an expectation of over 1 megawatt of power output at the Tesla Semi event. This aligns with reports from early last year that stated it would be 1.5 megawatts. However, in the most recent report from late last year, Pepsi told Reuters that they would be installing four 750 kilowatt stalls. They also said that the semi charges 80% in 35 to 45 minutes, which means there's a discrepancy here. 750 kilowatts of steady state power is only enough to provide around 450 kilowatt hours in 35 to 45 minutes. The semi battery is at least 900 kilowatt hours, which means about a 50% charge in 35 to 45 minutes with a 750 kilowatt charger. A 50% charge in 35 to 45 minutes doesn't align with what Tesla's advertised for the semi, which is 70% in 30 minutes. If they're advertising that, it would surprise me if they don't have a charger that can provide enough power to support that claim. What would a 70% charge in 30 minutes take? As I said a moment ago, the semi battery looks to be rated for 900 kilowatt hours or more. The 2170 battery cells that are likely being used in the semi are also used by the long-range Tesla Model 3, which maxes out at a 3C rate when fast charging. A 3C rate means the ability to charge at a power input that's three times the kilowatt hour rating. In the case of a 900 kilowatt hour battery, that's 2.7 megawatts. However, the 3C charge rate is for a 0 to 80 percent charge in 30 minutes rather than 0 to 70 percent. To account for the difference between the 70% and 80% charge rate, I've multiplied 2.7 megawatts by 7 eighths to arrive at 2.3 megawatts. That's a very rough number, but I think it puts the charger requirement for the semi at, at least, 2 megawatts. Some people might point out that a 70% charge on a 900 kilowatt hour battery pack is 630 kilowatt hours. If that power needs to be delivered in 30 minutes, wouldn't that mean the mega charger only needs to supply 1260 kilowatts of power? No, because provided that the cells are well cooled, the charge slope is dictated by how quickly the battery can store energy at the chemical level. If we again use a Tesla Model 3 battery as an example and scale the charging power to the semi-battery pack from a 0 to 35% state of charge, the average power output would be about 1600 kilowatts. And then from a 35 to 70% state of charge, it would be about 1000 kilowatts. The average of those two numbers is 1300 kilowatts from 0 to 70%, which is near the 1260 kilowatts of average power that would be needed if there was no no charge slope. What are the ways that I could be wrong on how much power the semi can accept or how much power the mega charger can supply? 
First, it may be a situation where Tesla starts with a conservative charge rate and increases it over time. The Model 3 Standard Range Plus started with a 100 kilowatt peak rate, and it was soon unlocked to 170 kilowatts through a software update. Second, if Tesla is using a battery cell with a different chemistry in the Tesla Semi, it may have a different charge slope than Tesla's other vehicles. But that seems unlikely because there's usually a compromise required where higher charging speed means shorter cycle life or lower energy density, both of which would be priorities for the Semi. The third way I could be wrong is if I have a fundamental misunderstanding of how the Semi battery would charge. If you think I do, let me know in the comments below. Fourth, Tesla says up to a 70% charge in 30 minutes. There are two versions of the Semi. Maybe only the 300 mile range version with the smaller pack will get enough power from the mega charger to hit the maximum charge rate. But that would go against the reports on the long range Frito Lay units, which are getting an 80% charge in 35 to 45 minutes. Fifth, and finally, it could be that although the base architecture and immersion cooling of the megacharger is good for 2 plus megawatts, they're still working out the kinks. That is, the current megachargers are a quick and dirty first generation that'll soon be replaced. This happened with the V1 supercharger, which was replaced about six months after it was unveiled. In light of all the conflicting information on the semi and mega charger, I'd say the likeliest power output will be in the range of 1.5 to 2 megawatts, with the upper end being around 2.3 megawatts. That's actually modest when compared to where the rest of the industry is headed. If Tesla's charger only hits 1.5 megawatts, it would have less than half the power output of the Charon standard, which is expected to deliver 3.75 megawatts next year. As a side note, as It's Kyle Connor points out on Twitter, Tesla's a member of Charon, and some people were expecting that they'd use the massive 3.75 megawatt Charon plug. However, according to the executive director at Charon, Tesla's not using the Charon plug. If that's correct, then it supports my view that the megacharger plug used at Frito-Lay is the plug that Tesla will use long term, because megacharger and semi deliveries have already started. I could still be wrong, but Kyle's thread provides some support for that view. What about Pepsi's claim of 750 watt charging stalls? It could be that they're referring to average power per stall. If there are four stalls at 750 kilowatts, that means three megawatts of total power on tap, and the mega charger might be able to shift power to whichever stall is in use. For example, if one semi is plugged in, depending on whether it can draw from the adjacent stall or all four stalls, it might be able to draw between 1500 to 3000 kilowatts. So Pepsi's claim doesn't necessarily conflict with the other information we have. We may just be missing detail. Let's move on to the grid-related implications of megachargers. To do that, we first need to get an appreciation of how much power is used by a megacharger. The building on screen is 400,000 square feet, or roughly 40,000 square meters. On average, a building like this would use about 1 megawatt of power at steady state. So if the megacharger uses 2 megawatts of power at peak output, one megacharger would be drawing as much power from the grid as two large commercial office buildings. And, of course, each megacharger station will be able to charge multiple semis at once. In fact, for a large distribution hub for a package delivery company, you're looking at over 500 trucks rotating on and off the megachargers. The numbers get insane pretty quickly. At a city or regional level, you can bet that when there's hundreds or thousands of battery-powered semis on the road, you can expect 500 semis charging at the same time at peak power. 500 semis charging at 2 megawatts is 1,000 megawatts, or 1 gigawatt of power. The nuclear power plant just north of where I live only puts out 850 megawatts of power, so we're talking a serious impact on the grid just from semis and not including passenger vehicles. Let's get back to a more manageable scale. The Frito-Lay megacharger station has four stalls. Let's assume each of those stalls fully charges six semis a day. I've picked six semis relatively randomly, so feel free to insert your own assumptions. Four stalls at six semis each is 24 charges a day. 
If each semi-pack is 900 kilowatt hours, that's 21.6 megawatt hours. If we bring back our 400,000 square foot office building with an average hourly usage of one megawatt, that's 24 megawatt hours. So even at just six semis per day per charging stall, the Frito-Lay charger would not just be using as much peak power as a large office building, it would also be using almost as much total energy over the course of a day. That is, mega chargers will need to be built in locations with a fairly robust grid, or Tesla's going to have to reinforce the grid where they build the mega charger stations. This will be especially true when they start building 8, 16, or 32 mega charger stations for industrial parks, truck stops, and large distribution centers. Power at that scale means those stations may need their own distribution substations to pull down high voltage power from transmission or subtransmission lines. My understanding is that the lead time for the equipment to build substations is currently around one to two years. But what if instead of using a substation, Tesla used a smaller grid connection and buffered it with mega packs and solar panels? For those who don't follow Tesla, a mega pack is a large battery system that can store over three megawatt hours of of energy per unit. Megapacks are placed near solar or wind farms to capture intermittent energy or can be used to reinforce the grid in place of peaker plants. They store power when not much power is being drawn by customers and then release the power when it's needed. That is, megapacks could be used to buffer the power demands of V4 superchargers and megapacks in place of a larger grid connection or substation. And that appears to be what Tesla's doing. First, as per the supercharger GOAT on Twitter, indications are that Tesla's first V4 supercharging station will use a megapack. The megapack will be coupled with a solar farm to provide an additional power buffer, reduce CO2 emissions, and reduce Tesla's power bill. Second, the Frito-Lay megacharger station we discussed earlier is also reportedly using a megapack. Let's take a step back and look at the strategic implications of megapacks for Tesla's charging network. Tesla has the largest DC fast charging network in the US, with 58% of the chargers. Not only that, Tesla's chargers almost always work. This is as opposed to some other charging networks where about half the chargers often aren't operational. The supercharger network is clearly a competitive moat for Tesla, but that moat may just get wider and deeper. When more vehicles with larger battery packs like electric semis, large pickup trucks, and vans hit the road, megawatt DC fast chargers will become essential. But they clearly require a lot more infrastructure, which will make it more technically difficult and costly to build them out. As far as I can tell, Tesla is the only company in the U.S. that's vertically integrated enough to build megawatt charging stations at scale in the hundreds or thousands within the next few years. This is because they build their own DC fast chargers in-house. They're the only company mass-producing grid-scale battery packs in the tens of gigawatts, and they have access to a large supply of battery cells from a range of manufacturers. Beyond using megapacks at charging sites for vehicle charging, there's also an arbitrage opportunity opportunity here. What do I mean by an arbitrage opportunity? Tesla has sophisticated grid management software for the megapacks, which allows them to buy and sell power from and to the grid. The megapack can draw cheap power from the grid during off-peak hours and release that energy back to the grid during peak hours at a higher price. That not only means more profits for Tesla, but also a more stable grid, because the megapacks will be acting to buffer the swings that occur between peak and off-peak power demand. That'll become increasingly useful as the proportion of intermittent, renewable energy generation on the grid increases with solar and wind deployments. In summary, my view is that the megacharger will support a power output of over 2 megawatts. That's because based on the charge curves of Tesla's other vehicles, 2 megawatts would be required to hit the advertised charging speed of the semi, which is a 70% charge in 30 minutes. However, 2 megawatts conflicts with reports of 1.5 megawatts or even 750 kilowatts. If those reports are correct, I suspect it wouldn't be to do with the base architecture of the megacharger. This is because the base architecture will need to be capable of multi-megawatt charging to future-proof the megacharger against competing standards like Charn, which has plans for a 3.75 megawatt charger. Rather, if the megacharger does charge the semi at 1.5 megawatts or less, it could be that Tesla is taking an abundance of caution with the new semi battery pack like they've done with past battery packs, or that they're expecting to rapidly iterate on the megacharger like they did with the first generation of the supercharger. 
if I'm incorrect on both the maximum charge rate and the reasons why there might be a lower charge rate, I'll be eager to make a video on why. That is, as soon as I figure out how Tesla defeated the charge curve and where my understanding of battery charging technology is lacking. Either way, I expect most megacharger and V4 supercharging stations will require a megapack, because even four megacharger stalls would use as much power as a large commercial building. The only alternative I could see would be to build substations at charging stations, but that would mean higher operational costs because there would be no way to buffer cheap power at off-peak rates, and it would also handicap Tesla's ability to grow because the wait times for substation equipment is one to two years. For the icing on the cake, the megapacks installed at Tesla's charging stations may offer an arbitrage opportunity. For each charging station that Tesla builds, they'll also be building a small power plant that will generate profits by buying power at off-peak rates and selling it back to the grid at peak rates. The only potential limiting factor for Tesla here seems to be access to battery supply. The manufacturing ramps for the Semi, Cybertruck, and Megapack will require an extreme supply of battery cells on top of the extreme supply required to ramp Tesla's passenger vehicles and power walls. Will Tesla have enough battery cells for an aggressive ramp of all these projects at once? According to Tesla, they do for the time being, but that's something I'll keep a close eye on. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video, or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to Jack Burgess for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.